This is the first in a series on 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And as I have studied 1st John, I've become convinced that it actually was first written or given as a sermon, not actually as a letter. It was a normal practice in the early church that uh, sermons actually would be transcribed or written down as they were being preached, and then they would be passed around from church to church. And uh, so I thought rather than me telling you what 1st John says, what better way to hear this sermon from Scripture than to actually hear the sermon? So uh, my sermon this morning will be 1 John. I'd actually encourage you not to follow along in your Bibles. If you want to go and check out, make sure I was telling you the truth later, you can uh, go back and read it for yourself. Um, but I actually have kind of compiled what I'm going to deliver to you from the New Living Translation as well as the NIV, the ESV, uh, pulling a little bit from the message, which is a paraphrase, and then sometimes going back into the Greek myself and kind of creating some of my own paraphrase as well. Um, but I, I can guarantee you, that this will be the best sermon you have ever heard because it literally is the Word of God. So you can be guaranteed of that this morning. From the very first day, we were there, taking it all in. We heard it with our ears. We saw it with our eyes, touched it with our own hands. The Word of life appeared right before our eyes. We saw it happen. And now we're telling you what we witnessed. It was incredible. The life of God himself took shape before us. We saw it, we heard it, and now we're telling you so that you can experience it with us. This experience of communion with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Our motive for telling you is simply this. We want you to enjoy this too. Because your joy will double our joy. This is, this is the essence of the message that we heard from Jesus and are passing along to you. You see, God himself is light. Pure light. In him there's no darkness at all. And, and so if we have claimed that we have received God's life, but we continue to kind of stumble around in the darkness, we're obviously lying through our teeth. We're not living what we claim. But if we walk in the light, God himself being the light, we also experience a shared life with one another as the sacrificed blood of Jesus, God's son, takes away all of our sin. If we claim that we're free from sin, we're only fooling ourselves claim like that is false nonsense. On the other hand, though, if we admit our sins, he is faithful. He, won't, he will be true to himself and he won't let us down. He'll forgive our sins and clean away all of our wrongdoing. If we claim that we don't have any sin, we out and out contradict God. A claim like that only shows off our own ignorance of who God really is. I'm saying all of this, dear children, to lead you out of sin. But if anybody does sin, there's someone in the presence of the Father to plead our case. Jesus Christ. Righteous Jesus. You see, when he served as a sacrifice for our sins, he solved the sin problem for good. Not only ours, but the whole world. And, and so here's how you can be sure that you know God. Do what he says. If someone says, I know him well, but doesn't do what he says, they're obviously a liar. Their life doesn't match their words. But anyone who keeps God's word is the person in, whose God, in whom God's love matures. This is the only way to be sure that we are in God. Anyone who claims to be intimate with God ought to live the way Jesus lived. My dear friends, I, I'm not saying anything new to you. This is literally the oldest command in the book, and you've known it from day one. What's new is that Jesus actually lived this command out in front of us and now gives us the power to live it out as well. The darkness fading away, the true light already blazing. Anyone who claims to live in God's light but hates their brother or sister is in the dark. 
It's the person who loves their brother and sister, who dwells in God's light and doesn't block that light from others. But whoever hates is still in the dark, stumbling around in the dark. They don't know which end is up. They're blinded by the darkness. And so I remind you, dear children, that your sins are forgiven in Jesus' name. You who are mature, the first to come to faith, you know the one who started all of this. And you newcomers to the faith have won a big victory over the evil one. A second reminder, dear children, you know the Father from personal experience. You who are mature know the one who started all of this. And you newcomers are so strong. God's word is steady in you. Your partnership with God enables you to win a victory over the evil one. Don't love the world's ways or the things it offers you. You see, love for the systems of this world that reward you squeeze out true love for God. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on its way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. Children, time is just about up. You see, you've heard that the Antichrist is coming. Well, they're all over the place. Antichrists everywhere you look. That's how we know that we're close to the end. You see, they left us, but they were never really with us. If they had been, they would have stuck it out with us, loyal to the end. But in leaving, they showed their true colors, showed they never did belong. But you belong. The Holy One has anointed you, and you know it. I'm not telling you something that you didn't know. I'm just just confirming the truth of what you do already know deep inside of you. And the truth doesn't produce lies. So who is it that's lying here? It's the person who denies that Jesus is the divine Christ. That's who. This is what makes an anti-Christ. Denying the Father, denying the Son. No one who denies the Son can possibly have any part in God the Father. But affirming the Son is actually an embrace of the Father. And so you stay with what you heard from the beginning. The original message. Let it sink into your life. You see, if what you've heard from the beginning lives deeply in you, then you will live deeply both in the Son and in the Father. And this is exactly what Christ promised us. Real life. Eternal life. You see, I'm warning you about those who are trying to deceive you. But they're no match for what is embedded deeply within you the anointing spirit of Jesus himself. You don't need their so-called teaching. Christ's anointing teaches you the truth on everything that you need to know about him and yourself. Uncontaminated by a single lie. Live deeply in what you were taught. And now, dear children, stay with Christ. Live deeply in Christ. And then you'll be ready for him when he appears, ready to receive him with open arms, unashamed when he arrives. Once you're convinced that he is righteous, that what Jesus has done is right, you'll recognize that all who practice righteousness are God's true children. You see, God's love is amazing. Just look at it. We are called children of God. And that's who we really are. That's why the world doesn't recognize us or or take us seriously because it has no idea who God is or what God really wants. But friends, that is exactly what we are. We are God's children. But that's only the beginning. Who knows how we'll end up? But what we do know is that when he finally appears, we will be like him. And everyone who looks forward to being like Jesus then works 
on being like Jesus now. Everyone who intentionally sins really doesn't care what God wants at all because sin is a major disruption of God's order. Of course, you know that Jesus showed up to get rid of sin. There's no sin in him or in anything that he does. And so, so no one who lives deeply in Christ can continue making a practice of sinning. No one who, who practices sin has taken a, a deep, hard look at Christ. They've got them all backwards. So my dear children, don't let anyone cause you to wander from this truth. It's the person who acts right, who is right, just as we see it lived out in our righteous Messiah. Those who make a practice of sin are straight from the devil, the pioneer in the practice of sin. But the Son of God entered to destroy the works of the devil. You see, people who, who are conceived and, and, and brought to life by God don't make a practice of sinning. How could they? God's seed is deep within them, making them who they are. It's not in the nature of those born of God to practice and parade sin. And so, so here's how you tell the difference between, between the children of God or the children of the devil. The one who refuses to practice loving others, which is the righteousness of God, isn't from God. It's a simple test. You see, because this actually is the original message that we should love each other. We, we, we shouldn't be like Cain who participated, who joined the evil one and then killed his brother. And why did he kill him? It's actually because his own ways were evil and it's his brother's ways that were righteous. So don't be surprised, friends, if the world hates you for your unconditional love of everyone. It's been going on a long time. The, the way that we know that we have been transferred from death into life is that we love our brothers and sisters. Anyone who doesn't love is as good as dead. And anyone who, who hates their brother and sister is a murderer. And, and you know that eternal life and murder have nothing to do with each other. And so this is how we have come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed his life for us. And so this is why we ought to live sacrificially for our fellow believers and not just be out for ourselves. If you have more than enough to live well and you see some brother or sister who's in need but you just turn a cold sh shoulder towards them and you do nothing, what happens to God's love? It just it disappears into thin air. And, and you are the one that made it disappear. My dear children, let's not just talk about love. Let's practice real love. This is the only way that we will know that we're truly living in God's reality. And it's actually also the way to, to shut down crippling self-criticism, even when there's something to it. Because God is greater than our worried hearts and knows more about us than we even know about ourselves. And friends, once that's taken care of and we're no longer accusing and condemning ourselves, we're bold and free before God. We're able to stretch our hands out and receive what we asked for because we're doing what he said, doing what God really wants. Again, this is God's command to believe his son, Jesus Christ. He is the one who told us to love one another in line with the original commandment. And so when we do what Jesus said, we actually become his partners and he partners with us. And this is how we experience the deep and abiding presence of Christ in us by the spirit that he gave to us. My dear friends, don't, don't believe everything that you hear. Carefully weigh and examine what people tell you. 
Because you see, everybody who talks about God is not actually from God. There's a lot of lying preachers around in the world. And and so here's how you test the genuine spirit of God. Those who openly say that they believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came as an actual flesh and blood person, that person comes from God and belongs to God. But everyone who refuses to believe Jesus, who he is and what he taught, has nothing in common with God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist that you heard was coming. Well, here it is, sooner than we thought. But my dear children, you come from God and belong to God. You have already won a big victory over those false teachers for the spirit in you is far stronger than anything in the world. These people belong to the Christ-denying world. They talk the world's language and the world eats it up. But we come from God and belong to God. Anyone, Anyone who knows God understands us and listens. But the person who has nothing to do with God will, of course, not listen. This is another test for telling the spirit of truth from the spirit of deception. My beloved friends, let us continue to love each other because love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. But the person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God. Because God is love. So you can't know him if you don't love. And and you see, this is how God showed his love for us. God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. And so this is the kind of love we are talking about. Not that we, once upon a time, loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away our sins and the damage they've done in our relationship with God. And so, my dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we certainly ought to love each other in the same way. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives deeply inside of us and his love becomes complete in us. Perfect love. This is how we know that we're living steadily and deeply in him and he in us. He's given us life from his life, from his very own spirit. Also, we've seen for ourselves and continue to say openly that the father sent his son as the savior of the world. And so everyone who talks and lives as if Jesus is God's son has an intimate relationship with God. We know it so well, we've embraced it heart and soul, this love that comes from God. You see, God is love. And so when we live lives of love, we live in God and God lives in us. This way love has run of the house, becomes at home and mature in us so that we're free of worry on judgment day because our standing in the world is identical with Christ. You see, there's no room in love for fear. A fearful life, the the, fear of of death, the fear of judgment is someone who's not yet fully formed in love. We, though, are going to love because we know that God loved us first, even when we didn't deserve it. If anyone boasts, I know God, but goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of it, they're a liar. If he won't love the person who he can see, how can he possibly love God who he can't see? You see, the command from Christ that we have is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. Everyone who believes that Jesus is in fact the Messiah is born of God. 
And so if we love the one who conceives the child, we'll surely, surely love the child that they have conceived as well. The reality test on, on whether or not we love God's children is this. Do we love God? Do we keep his commandments? And the proof that we love God comes when we keep his commandments, and it's really not that hard. Everyone born of God defeats the world's ways. We bring the world to its knees through our faith. And the person who wins out over the world's ways is simply the one who believes Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus, the divine Christ, he experienced a life-giving birth and a death-killing death. Not only birth from the womb, but, but baptismal birth into his ministry and sacrificial death. And all the while, the Spirit is confirming the truth, the reality of God's presence at Jesus' baptism and crucifixion, bringing those occasions alive for us as well. A triple testimony, the Spirit, the baptism, the crucifixion. And the three are in perfect agreement. And if we take human testimony at face value, how much more should we be reassured when God gives a testimony like this, testifying concerning his son? And so whoever believes in the son of God knows in their heart that God can be trusted. And whoever refuses to believe in effect, calls God a liar, refusing to believe God's own testimony about his son. And you see, this is what God testifies, that he gave us eternal life, and that life is in his son. So whoever has the son has life, and whoever rejects the son rejects life. You see, my, my purpose in saying these things to you is that, that you who believe in God's Son will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have eternal life. Real life, not, not an illusion of life. Real life. And how bold and free we then become in His presence, freely asking according to His will, sure that God is listening to us. And if we're confident that he's listening, we know that what we've asked for is as good as ours. For instance, if we see a, a Christian believer sinning, and, and clearly I'm not talking about those who make a practice of sinning in the way that's fatal, right? Failing to love, which is murder. If we see someone sinning, we, we ask for God's help, and he clearly gives it, gives life to the sinner whose sin is not fatal. There, there is such a thing as fatal sin, and I'm not urging you to pray about that. You see, everything we do wrong is sin, but not all sin is fatal. We know that none of those born of God make a practice of sinning. Those who are born of God are protected by God. The evil one can't lay a hand on them. And so we know that we are held firm by God. It's only the people of the world that continue in the grip of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God came so we could recognize and understand the truth of God. What a gift. And we are living the truth itself in God's Son, Jesus Christ. This Jesus is both true God and real life. Dear children, stay away from fake gods.